Great. Um, we're going to get started now. It's 11 a.m. And welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, I'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar about how climate change is impacting hurricanes. Uh, my name is Susan Glickman, and I'm the Florida Director of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. And as we all know, June 1st marks the official start of hurricane season. So this is a particularly important and uh, timely subject. For those of you not familiar with Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, we're a nonprofit organization that promotes responsible energy choices that will work uh, to address the impacts of global climate change and ensure clean and safe and healthy communities through, throughout the Southeast. Today's presentation is a collaboration between SACE and Rethink Energy Florida as part of each of our organization's ongoing climate change education campaigns. Rethink Energy Florida is a nonprofit, nonpartisan 501c3 education organization working on energy issues based in Tallahassee, Florida and operating statewide. Now I'd like to take just a moment to review the basic functions of the Zoom platform on the bottom of your screen. And to ensure sound quality, all of the attendee lines are now muted throughout the presentation. That's going to last about 15 minutes. And if you're having trouble hearing or seeing the slides, just click that chat button, button on the bottom and uh, type in your problem so we can help you troubleshoot there. And then we will unmute the lines and have a questions and answers after the presentation. So for those of you that have logged in via the Zoom platform, please click on the button to raise your hand um, and then we can unmute you for your particular question or you can even submit a written question uh, with the Q&A button along the bottom of your screen. So if you're just joining by phone and we have a couple people um, that are doing that, we unfortunately aren't, un aren't able to unmute you. So if you could just please email questions directly to me, my email address is susan at cleanenergy.org. It's susan at cleanenergy.org. And the last thing before I turn the program over to uh, Dr. Timothy Hall is that we are recording this webinar. So it will be available for your review later at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy webinar archive. And our email address, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, is cleanenergy.org. And so that will be available um, if in perpetuity, uh, if you need to refer to a slide or something, you know, later on stories that you might be writing about hurricanes two months from now. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Timothy Hall. And Dr. Hall, we're very grateful for you uh, sharing your time with us today. Uh, Tim Hall is a senior scientist at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York. He's an adjunct professor at Columbia University. His area of interest is statistical and mathematical analysis of climate, especially extreme weather risks. Much of Dr. Hall's research focuses on the relationship between tropical cyclones and climate, and particularly the hazard these storms pose for coastal populations. As part of his research, he's constructed statistical models of tropical cyclones to estimate landfall probabilities and landfall impacts on populated areas and how they vary with climate. Recently, he's extended the work to North American winter storm hazards as well. In addition to his academic appointments, Dr. Hall works as a consultant to reinsurance companies, commercial natural catastrophe modeling companies, and to Florida's Hurricane Catastrophe Fund. He holds a PhD in physics from Cornell University, and he's published more than 60 scientific articles, as well as book chapters and features and forums aimed at the insurance industry. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Hall. Um, thank you, Susan, and I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, it's great to be here, and I want to thank you, Susan, Susan Glickman, the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, um, for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, my name is Tim Hall, and I work at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City on the Columbia campus. And as Susan said, I do research in extreme weather and climate. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about hurricanes and climate. Um, and this first slide actually shows three hurricanes from um, last year, 2017 season, spinning simultaneously in Atlanta, Katia, Irma, and Jose. Um, well, the 2018 season is just about upon us. In fact, we've already had one. Yep. This is Chris. Um, we actually can't see your slides. You can't. 
No, I think you need to um, share your screen. Okay, sorry about that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, to this is Melissa, yeah, go. Yep, we got it now. Okay. So go ahead and put it in presentation view. All right, I'm gonna start again then. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, sorry about that glitch, everyone. I hope everyone can see my slides now. Um, yes, yeah, so um, my talk is on hurricanes and climate, and this first slide is um, a picture of three storms spinning simultaneously at Sulphur Rare Event in the, from last season, 2017, Katia, Irma, and Jose. Um, and as the 2018 season is just about upon us, in fact, we've already had one named storm that's drenched on um, the Florida Panhandle, Alberto. Um, we're understandably alarmed by the potential because we look back at 2017 and remember that it was really um, one for the record books with um, Harvey's absolutely astonishing rainfall on Houston, um, Maria's devastation of Puerto Rico's infrastructure, um, including at least 5,000 deaths attributed to Maria, um, and Irma's Category 5 landfall on multiple islands in the Caribbean, including the Florida Keys. Um, there are lots of statistics um, one can point to to illustrate the intensity of the 2017 season. Um, for example, there were six major hurricanes that formed category three or higher on the Safer Simpson scale compared to a historical average of two that ranked 2017 third by that metric. Um, and there were two category five hurricanes that made landfall. In fact, if you count the individual landfalls, of these category five hurricanes, especially Irma, which hit multiple Caribbean islands at Cat 5. Actually, it's kind of astonishing to realize that 2017 saw a quarter of all historical category five landfalls. It was a pretty unlucky season for us. Um, in terms of estimates of dollar losses on the US, three of the top five dollar loss events um, are in 2017, with um, Hurricane Harvey at number two, just be $125 billion estimate just behind 2005's Katrina. But hurricane climate analysis should be based on a long-term view and a physical understanding, not just one active season. And so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna focus for the bulk of this talk on the long-term view and a physical understanding of hurricanes and climate. And I'm gonna focus on um, three particular climate hurricane factors. Um, I like to rank these factors um, in terms of their certainty, what we know nearly for sure, and what might be important, but it's a little bit less certain. One, for sure, sea level is rising. That's one of the most robust projections of a warming climate, and that will lead to greater storm surge. Just the same winds blowing on a higher baseline will drive more water inland. Two, almost as robust is that um, warmer air holds more moisture, more water in the vapor form, and that can lead to more intense rain events. And three is a topic that's received an enormous amount of attention um, by researchers in the field and publicity, and that, and that there's really a pretty good strong consensus now that um, a warmer ocean is increasing the intensity of hurricanes. It's not necessarily making more hurricanes, but those that do form can get more intense. Um, topics for, and I'll be focusing on those three topics in this talk, but I'll just mention two other topics that are less certain but still intriguing and potentially alarming. Um, one is that um, an, an evolving climate is leading to changes in the Earth's general circulation, including changes in the mid-latitude jet stream, which helps to determine hurricane tracks, and it may allow for the possibility of more meandering hurricane tracks and more stalls like Hurricane Harvey did off the Texas coast and more abrupt turns like Hurricane Sandy's left-hand turn when it slammed into New Jersey in 2012. Um, also, um, they're actually, um, surprisingly, even though that we're, we're, there's a strong consensus that the intensity of storms is increasing, we're a lot less sure about the frequency of storms. Um, it, it could be that there are fewer storms in a warmed climate, um, but what really matters is the intensity of the ones that do form. So the first three topics is what I'm focusing on. And the first is sea level rise, in order of certainty here. Um, as I said, it's one of the most robust projections of a warming climate that the global oceans are rising. And it's simply because um, seawater, warmer seawater takes up more volume. So over the industrial era to the present day, we've had about 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters of globally average sea level rise. 
This is the figure on the top left um, up, up from 1800 to um, up to the 21st century. So obviously past the current day, these are projections. So what's going to happen in the future? We've had 20, 20 centimeters so far. What happens in the future? Well, it's accelerating. There's a lot of uncertainty about sea level rise mid and late this century. The uncertainty is mostly due to not really knowing what the human emissions will be into the atmosphere and how much warming we'll get. Um, so projections are anything from a low estimate of 30 more centimeters, 0.3 meters, up to high estimates of two and a half meters, depending on carbon emissions. But actually, so far, most of the sea level rise we see is due to the thermal expansion of the ocean, but an increasingly large fraction is due to um, the melting of land-based ice sheets. And you can see an example there from Greenland's ice sheet in the lower right. Um, actually, land-based ice sheets don't melt like ice cubes on a plate, say, in sunlight. They ebb and they flow and they crack and they slide and they calve off into the ocean in complicated ways. And the physics of those processes is not well uh, uh, represented in climate models, unfortunately, at this time. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, but it's going to be an increasingly large fraction of sea level rise going forward. Um, and another important point is that sea level rise has a lot of regional variability. Um, the global mean picture is what I show in the time series in the top right, but under that it are trends of sea level rise um, in the current day based on satellite estimates. Red being positive and a few blue spots here and there of actually sea level decline, but overall it's definitely rising, but with a lot of variability. It's actually kind of interesting why there's variability. Um, partly it's due to changing ocean currents, but another part, a subtle but important part, is that as land-based ice sheets melt, it changes the gravitational attraction of seawater to those ice sheets, and that has a regional signature. Um, it's actually those sea level, as far as coastal populations are concerned, it's sea level compared to the land, the local land that matters, and the land itself can be rising or sinking. Um, so, um, uh, for instance, along the Gulf Coast, um, so if you look, there's a real hot spot in the Gulf off the U.S. Gulf Coast where the sea level rises, the relative sea level rise to the land is well above the, the um, global mean. And then I show an inset in the upper right of sea level rise, relative sea level rise in Miami going forward and projections are Miami of somewhere between 30 more centimeters up to 1.2 meters. So um, what's, the, what's the coupling between sea level rise and hurricane hazard? Well, it's primarily in the hazard of surge of a hurricane. And it turns out that Florida has some of the most surge vulnerable cities in the US. Actually in the 2015 report by the commercial modeling company, Karen Clark, Clark and Company, um, she ranked Tampa as the most surge vulnerable city in the US. Why Tampa? Well, because of a couple of reasons. If you look in the left-hand figure, the coastal waters on the Gulf Coast of Florida are very shallow for a long way out. So if you imagine surge as wind blowing a volume of water towards the coast, if the same amount of water is being displaced over shallower seas, it has to rise higher and penetrate deeper inland. In addition, Tampa Bay's geometry doesn't help. Um, if the winds are just right, and this is the center picture, if the winds are just right pointed into Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay kind of acts like a funnel and the water gets pushed in there and it has a hard time getting out. In fact, um, Karen Clark and company estimated that the 100-year surge flood on Tampa, that's the flood that has 1% probability of, per year of happening, was about 10 feet, and that the damage would be around $175 billion. And maybe that damage is not surprising since about 50% of the population of Tampa lives below 10 feet. Um, that's for the current day. That's for current sea level conditions. What about um, plausible future sea level conditions? Well, let's look at the figure on the right. Um, the black line, the dark line, and the dots is an estimate of what we call a return period curve, and that's the surge magnitude on the y-axis in meters here um, as a function of the average time you have to wait for that surge to occur or the, the return period. So, for instance, 100 years, 10 squared on the x-axis. That's the 100-year flood. I trace that up, I find the intersection of the curve, and look over on the y-axis, it's about three meters or 10 feet. Now, um, what happens if I add, say, 30 inches of sea level? That's a highish but totally plausible amount by mid-century. 
Well, to first approximation, I just shift everything up by 30 inches, about three quarters of a meter. Um, and that's the yellow curve I've put in there. And now if I look at the, what was the 100 year event, the 10 squared event of three meters, and I trace that over, where does it intersect the yellow curve? At about 30 years. So the 1% probability per year under current sea level conditions becomes the 3% probability per year under um, plausible sea level rise conditions by mid-century. That's a three times increase in, in the probability, annual probability. And, and I might add that a 3% chance per year is a really pretty large chance. If you think about it over, say, the, um, the 30 year lifespan of a typical mortgage, 3% per year translates to about a 60% occurrence rate over the lifetime of a mortgage. Okay, so that's surge. Now the next topic I wanna to talk about is hurricane intensity. You often hear it said that warm seawater is the fuel for hurricanes, and that as the oceans warm up, the hurricanes will have more fuel and they get more intense. That's actually an incomplete picture. And at the risk of lecturing here, and this may be a big risk, I wanna to try to fill in um, another detail, sort of get to the next level of detail in that picture. And basically, I'm gonna to try to describe in a few words the equations that go into weather models that simulate hurricanes. What is the basic driving force of a hurricane? Well, you've got wind blowing over a hot ocean. Hot water can evaporate easily. The winds pick up that evaporation, spiraling it into the center of the storm where it rises. That moist air, as it rises, it cools down. The water vapor condenses, it releases the heat of condensation, further fueling the rising. That's, that's the basic sort of thermodynamics of driving a hurricane. Um, but, so you might think um, a warmer ocean, more fuel, more water vapor evaporating, and more um, condensation, more circulation, stronger hurricanes. But hang on a second. Actually, if the surface air is also very warm because it's trying to catch up to the ocean, if it, if it gets as warm as the ocean below it, then it's saturated in water vapor. It can't take any more water vapor. So that would seem to stall out this, um, this um, storm forming. It's really the difference between the warm ocean and the air above it that drives the hurricane. Not just the warm ocean, but the difference between the warm ocean and the air above it. The air above it wants to be a little bit cooler and drier in order to drive this evaporation that fuels the hurricane. But how can the air above it be warmer and drier if it's sitting over a hot, warm, a hot ocean with infinite amount of water available? because a hurricane circulation is deep and violent. It reaches way up into the upper, strat up, upper troposphere, almost into the stratosphere, the upper reaches of the atmosphere that are much cooler. And it mixes down that cool air, that cool drier air, to back to the surface. So it actually keeps the surface cooler and drier than the ocean, which allows for evaporation. So these ingredients, the, the hot ocean, the difference, the hotter than the air sitting above it, in this vertical variation in temperature through the atmosphere, those ingredients are the thermodynamic elements that determine the speed limit, the, in, the maximum intensity a storm can achieve. We call that the potential intensity in the business, but, um, but you might call it the thermodynamic speed limit. Most storms don't reach that speed limit for a variety of weather vagary reasons, but some do. Like last year, Irma and Maria, um, reach their potential speed limit at certain points in their track. Now, what happens when the oceans warm? Well, the oceans are warming, but the atmosphere is also warming. So is that difference changing? If the difference weren't changing, you wouldn't get stronger storms. But now I get to my second point, and this is something that's not so appreciated, I think, um, about um, the physics of, of greenhouse warming. Yes, if we add more greenhouses to the atmosphere, we warm the surface airs, but we do not warm the upper atmosphere because basically greenhouse gases are like a blanket. They're keeping heat in near the surface, but the upper atmosphere is sitting above that blanket. It's just seeing space above it. So um, what's happening is the lower atmosphere warms, the upper atmosphere is not warming. Um, so you can have the oceans warming and the lower atmosphere is warming too, but in the presence of a hurricane, it's mixing down that cold air from above that's not warming and keeping that difference alive. In fact, the difference is increasing. Um, so that's how you can have increasing intensity, and that's a couple of levels of extra detail 
And I, I, I hope you get a flavor of that in this um, cartoon picture. But the, um, the take home messages are that there is this speed limit, this thermodynamic speed limit based on just the ocean temperature and the vertical variation of temperature in the atmosphere. And the speed limit is increasing as the oceans increase. Not all hurricanes reach their speed limit, but some do. What's happening as you increase the speed limit is you're just sort of hurricane in their intensity, you know, at the low end, you know, sort of barely hurricanes. And at the high end, as high as their speed limit will allow. And if you stretch out that distribution, if you allow um, for a higher high end, you're going to get um, a greater fraction of storms above any given threshold, say in category four or five. Um, and so as time goes forward, we are and we will be seeing a greater fraction of storms that form at the higher, highest intensity categories. And some storms will reach intensities never seen historically. So what is this speed limit, this, this potential energy actually doing? Well, this, now I'm, now I'm on, um, looking at the upper left-hand figure, and this is a satellite-based map of this potential intensity, trends of it from 1979 to 2010. Um, red is positive trends, blue are negative trends. So you see it's actually pretty splotchy currently. Um, there are plenty of red, and it turns out red is winning out if you make the global average over blue, but there are plenty of regions that, where it's not increasing. If we look at regions, however, where it is increasing, and we look at the actual hurricane statistics, it's bearing out what we expect. Um, so for instance, I looked at um, uh, hurricane activity in over a 35 year period in the Eastern North Pacific, which is a hot spot for increasing potential energy. Um, and this is the figure in the upper right. And basically what I did was I binned the number of hurricanes according to their safer Simpson category. Category zero means sub-hurricane status. Um, one, two, three, four, and five, and I separated it based on whether it was above average year of above average warm year, according to ocean temperature, red, and a blue average year, blue. So if I look at categories zero and one, well, there's not that much difference. I mean, the, the just roughly as many storms occurred in blue years as in hot years in those categories. But if I look at the higher intensity, especially category four or five, you see that there's the vast majority of storms that reach that intensity only occurred in the warm years. So that bears out this um, expectation that um, there may not be a change in overall hurricane frequency or tropical cyclone frequency, but the storms that reach the highest intensity categories are increasing. And that signal is now popping out of the noise. A decade ago, we were hard pressed, we had this expectation theoretically, but we were hard pressed to see whether it was actually happening because these are rare events, right? But it's now popping out of the noise. The take, and now what's going to happen going forward, that's the um, figure on the lower right. Um, these are climate model predictions, late 21st century of this potential energy or the thermodynamic speed limit. Now most of the ocean is red. So the potential intensity is increasing currently and it's expected to, to in continue increasing. And the punchline is that, it, yes, it's increasing and that there may actually be a slight reduction in in the frequency of total tropical cyclones, but a greater number will reach the highest intensity, although there's plenty of regional uncertainty. A major point I wanna make here, and that's in bold red font low down, we really care about the fraction of storms that reach the highest intensity because the destructive energy of a hurricane, what we call a power dissipation, varies as the wind speed to the third power cubed. In other words, Twice the wind speed corresponds to eight times the wind hazard. The corollary is, is that it's the few strongest landfalling hurricanes do the vast amount of damage. That's true historically, and it will certainly be true going forward. So if those storms are increasing in frequency, you would expect increasing damage and hazard. So my third topic is rainfall and hurricanes. And I'm going to use Hurricane Harvey from last year as an illustration. When it rains, it pours. Hurricane Harvey and the intensified hydrologic cycle. Um, this is actually pretty interesting, I think. And it's a, it's a great paper. I'm, I'm, I, the, the figures on the left come from a great recent paper by Kevin Tremberth in the last couple of months. Um, what I'm showing on the left are heat maps, the maps of the heat content in the Caribbean and Gulf just before Harvey's passage the top panel and just after the bottom panel. Look in the top panel, a big um, red bullseye in the Western Gulf, a lot of heat there. And then the bottom panel, 
lo and behold, it's gone. So where did all that heat energy go? Well, it's completely accounted for um, by Kevin Tremberth and company. Basically, it went entirely into the heat of evaporation, into water vapor in the Gulf. Harvey, sitting off the Gulf Coast, carried all that water vapor over Houston. Then it went into the heat of condensation and rainfall, and an astonishing amount of rainfall. In fact, if you added up all the rain droplets and brought them all together, it would be a cube of water more than two miles on a side. And that's a really um, kind of mind-blowing picture on the upper right. Imagine a, a two cubic mile volume of water dropping on your city. Um, and this, this ability to account for um, the rainfall in terms of the heat of the nearby ocean points to the relationship that's happening as climate changes. More ocean heat corresponds to more water vapor, corresponds to the possibility of more intense rain events, rain events when the conditions are right, as they are in a hurricane. And this equation and the fact that the Gulf is warming, as all oceans are warming, due primarily to human emissions into the atmosphere, allows us to say what fraction of Harvey's rainfall is due to this warming. Because the Gulf warms and you get more water vapor in the Gulf. That figure on the lower left is actually the history of water vapor over the Gulf. The red line is um, historical um, measurements and the blue line, the black line are model results. It's increasing and that can be directly attributed to rainfall in the region. And when you do that, you find that something like 20 to 38% of Harvey's rainfall is due to Gulf warming. So roughly about a third of Harvey's rainfall is due to Gulf warming. Another way to say this is to do something called an attribution study. And that is we can use a weather model to simulate Harvey a bunch of times under current day realistic conditions of climate, like a warmed, industrially warmed climate, and a hypothetical climate that didn't warm industrially. And when you do that, you find that an event like Harvey that dumps at least the amount of water that Harvey did is four times more likely in the warmer climate than it is um, in the hypothetical non-warm climate. Um, you know, we used to say in this business about a decade ago when people asked, does Climate change in a warming climate, did it have um, some role in some particular intense event that people were reporting about of the day? And we used to say, we used to sort of hedge ourselves and we, were, we would equivocate and we would say, well, you can never attribute any particular event to warming. You have to look at long-term trends, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we, when people ask that question, we just say yes. We say yes because the signal is popping through the noise and we say yes because we now have the tools is these attribution studies to really be hard-nosed and estimate the fraction of this extreme event that is due to climate change. And that's what we did in Harvey. And in fact, all across the US, the fraction of rain falling in the most intense events is increasing. Some regions are getting wetter and some are drier, but when the rain is falling, is fewer and more intense events. And that really concludes the section of my talk on hurricanes and climate change, but I had one more slide in my talk because, um, of course, we, all, we are all still interested in what 2018 holds for us. And um, that gets to the question of seasonal forecasting. And I play this game and others do as well. And I call it a bit of a parlor game. And, and I don't say that to take it lightly. It would be really important to know um, what the next couple of months, the season in front of us, um, holds and how hazardous it will be. But it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. And we have, you know, pretty small skill at doing it. Um, in fact, it's kind of interesting, this lack of skill, because if you look at um, weather forecasting, we're pretty good at a couple of days out, maybe even a week out of, of forecasting weather and say the tracks of a hurricane that's actually spinning right now. Um, but, uh, and if you look at climate change projections, like decade by decade, well, you know, given assumptions about what we're going to spit into the atmosphere, we're pretty good at doing that too, because you average over the weather noise when you look decade by decade. But there's an intermediate time scale regime between, say, a month or so and a couple of years. There's kind of a minimum in that time scale for a forecast skill. It's the hardest thing for us to do. We're well beyond what we can forecast with weather models, but we're still in, in um, uh, several months to say a year or two 
the natural variability, the natural chaos of the climate system and the ocean atmospheric system still dominates over the inexorable trend of climate change. But that doesn't stop us from trying. We still go ahead and try. And I've been doing this for a couple of years, several years now. Let's see how I did in 2017. Well, the panel, the upper row, the panel on the left, is um, were forecasts in May of 2017, just before the season started, of um, ocean heat. And that box I've drawn in the subtropical Atlantic is the most important box for hurricanes in the Atlantic. And you see it was really a temperature warm spot. There were projections in 2017, and these were borne out, that the Atlantic, the subtropical Atlantic, the main development region, as we call it, was warm. And then I, I, I um, run a, a, a hurricane model I built. It generates statistical um, hurricanes that, have, um, that are consistent with that heating. And how did I do in 2017? That's the third plot on the top. Well, this is just the accumulated hurricanes that formed in the basin, May through December. Um, yellow is my model forecast. Blue is the historical mean. And red is what actually happened. Franklin, Gert, Harvey, Irma, Jose, Katya, Maria, Lee, Nate, Ophelia. Those are all the hurricanes that formed in 2017. And well, I actually under forecasted a little bit, but I did a lot better than the historical mean. And since I'm simulating tracks, my hurricane tracks, I can project that onto um, state by state hurricane incidence rates, which I forecast also. And everywhere it was um, above average, although with a lot of uncertainty. Okay, so with um, sort of naive optimism and maybe foolhardy optimism, I, I tried again for 2018. Um, and now, yes, the oceans are warming everywhere. I mean, the oceans are warming for sure in, in a warmer climate, but it doesn't happen uniformly. Season by season, you can have warm and cold splotches. So it turns out in 2018, the projections are for that, that boxed region in the Atlantic that the sea, the sea surface temperatures will be about neutral, actually, not warm or cold compared to a historical mean. So then I simulate my hurricanes under those conditions. I look at the number of storms forming under those conditions in the third lower um, panel. And yeah, it's, I get my simulations, the light blue are pretty much on historical mean. And when I project that onto landfall rates, I get slight reductions, but they're not statistically significant. So basically my forecast is for an average 2018 hurricane season. But, I should be legally obliged to make the following proviso, and that is that even in very inactive years, since we don't have a lot of skill at doing these seasonal forecasts, even in inactive years, you can get devastating hurricanes. 1992 is the classic example. 1992 was an inactive year. It had only one major hurricane compared to say two average and six last year. But that one major hurricane made a category five landfall in Miami, Hurricane Andrew which launched the whole industry of catastrophe modeling for the insurance industry. And on that, I will um, call it quits and thank everyone and Susan Glickman and take any questions. Yeah, and Dr. Hall, can you uh, flip back the hosting abilities to Kyle James? So you're gonna right click on his name so that he can help us with the Q and A. Uh, um. I think I can, but I should be able to. Um, I don't frankly see his name. Um, hey, Chris or Kyle, can you? Yeah, it should be, Tim, it should be back where the actual webinar is. It won't be a um, window like I that. I see participants and then yeah. click on your name, um, yeah. Chris, right? Uh, actually, Kyle, James. I'm sorry, sorry. Um, uh, Sorry about this, guys. Um, participants. So you can, apparently you can be a NASA scientist but not always know how to do Zoom. Is that what we're understanding? <laughs> I clicked on your name, Kyle. Did that do it? <laughs> Did that do it? And then, uh, no, not yet. I think you have to right click and just select. Um, oh, I'm on a Mac, which doesn't have right click. But Control uh, or command click. Yeah, command click on your name. Um, darn it. Um, I did, but why is Can we just unmute everybody, Kyle? Yeah, um, I just don't have the capabilities with Tim being the host. Um, if Tim, if Tim, uh, you can see the other participants, um, I see that 
David is raising his hand. So we do have a question coming in. If you can um, see those. No, I don't see those. I only see me, Melissa, Susan, Chris, and Kyle. Well, let me do this. Let me ask a question that Daniel Cusick is asking um, uh, while we're figuring that out. And uh, Dr. Hall, he's asking, was there any signature in last week's subtropical storm Alberto that stands out as a harbinger of what's in store for this year? Um, the simple answer is no. <laughs> Um, you know, it's you, you can't say one storm at the beginning of the season is a harbinger for um, the rest of the season. If I were halfway through the season and, you know, I could say that, well, there's the first half of the season been very active, that would be a harbinger for the second half of the season, but not at a single storm, no. Great. I'm really sorry about this. I don't know how to... Oh, no, you've done it. It says Kyle's the host now. Oh, yes. Okay, great. So, uh, Kyle, can you um, unmute David Adams, please? There we go. David? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Good, thanks. Um, uh, thanks, for, that was a um, great presentation. Um, uh, tell me, the... Uh, I'm writing a story right now looking at the new hurricane season, particularly from the point of view of homeowners insurance. Um, our our um, insurance modelers factoring in um, climate change uh, to their models. And, um, you know, do they, are the insurance, is the insurance industry talking to people like you? Um, you're asking, do they factor in climate change to their, um, their models? Yeah. Well, you know, the short answer is no, they don't. And that's primarily because um, the way the insurance industry works and that, that um, insurance policies are typically renewed annually. That, um, on a year-to-year -year basis, even though they're everyone, all you know, the insurance industry acknowledges climate change and reinsurance companies actually do climate change research and they fund climate change research. I mean, if, if you're renewing policies annually, um, the, the climate change signal never quite pops out of the noise year by year. Now, we are getting a lot of static. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Tim, is that you? I don't think so. Is it? All right. We'll just try to speak up a little bit, and I don't know, unless David... David, maybe you can put yours on mute. Okay, Tim, keep going. Right. So um, it's an unfortunate fact that insurance policies renewed annually, both homeowners insurance and typically reinsurance policies, and that because of that, it's, it's never the case that it's compelling to include climate change in next year's activity if you're just looking at annual renewal. Of course, I mean, other things matter too, like um, long-term company portfolios, they're looking further than a year out. Um, and, you know, um, so they will may adjust their, their portfolios based on their expectations well, for much further than a year out. But the individual homeowner's insurance, since it renews annually, it never quite sees the signal of climate change. Thanks. Does that help you or do you have a follow-up for that? Um, no, that was very helpful. Um, I'm just wondering, if you, do, do, um, does your answer mean um, that that is that the insurance industry is being sensible, or, or do you think they would be more they'd be advised to actually take an even closer look at climate science? Or do you think that, as you said, the the way that they work on a, uh, with annual um, policies is, is simply um, doesn't wouldn't make sense for them to be looking at climate science? Well, from their perspective, I, I'm not an expert, so, uh, you know, uh, but I, I suspect that from their perspective, um, they can, if they look at longer range projections of, say, flood probability or, or wind probability on the coast, they will adjust as time goes on 
their year by year premiums and they will adjust their exposure, like, you know, not insuring certain properties or move or adjusting their portfolio of exposure as time goes on. Um, so in, in that sense, it sort of is incorporated. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I think of all the industries I can think of, they're the ones that have skin in the game more than anyone else. And, and, and they, they are quite aware of the issue and, and um, they, they are trying to, you know, a, a, a adjust themselves accordingly. Um, you know, I, I would like, I would love to see sort of longer term insurance policies that say, you know, don't just go year by year, but actually, you know, um, look at five or 10 years out. I don't really know, you know, if it's just historical or what drives or what drives this sort of um, desire to have annual policies. I'm not enough of an expert to say what happens there. Right. Because from what you just projected for 2018, um, it does turn out to be an inactive season. And, and let's uh, say we don't get a, an Andrew. Um, I can just see everybody sighing a big sigh of relief and saying, ah, well, um, you know, we keep building. Yeah, I don't think actually that um, the insurers and reinsurers and the commercial models they rely on don't really use seasonal forecasts. They use long forecasts that are based on longer term um, baselines. And that's mostly because, you know, they recognize that the skill is low for seasonal forecasting. Thanks very much. Right. So, Dr. Hall, I have a follow-up from Daniel uh, Cusick with e and &E, and then uh, a question from Bruce Ritchie from Politico, but let me go ahead and do the follow-up first. So, regarding rising hurricane intensity, is intensity primarily determined by wind speed, or is rainfall also a function of hurricane intensity? Example, Harvey. Should we be looking uh, for future hurricanes to be windier, wetter, or both? Um, yes, it's a good point. That I mean, rainfall and intensity are, are not separate. They're interlinked. The amount of rain that a hurricane produces is related to its intensity. A stronger winds will encourage more evaporation and get more water vapor into the atmosphere, which then can condense and produce rain. So um, Harvey's, uh, Harvey's uh, the amount of rain that Harvey dumped is only partly due to just more um, due to just more water vapor directly from a warmer ocean. It's also due to the fact that the warmer ocean increased the intensity of Harvey, and that exacerbated just the more water vapor. You pick, you have a warmer ocean that can evaporate more, but you also pick up more of that vapor because the wind speeds are higher. Great. So they're related, yes. Great. Now from Bruce Ritchie, how do you define the storm that would go from a 1% to a 3% for the Tampa Bay area besides a one in 100 year storm. Does it correspond to the hurricane um, um, on the, the Saffir Simpson scale? And does that increase uh, correspond to the rest of Florida or other places? Okay, well in that slide, I was looking at surge, not necessarily the intensity by Saffir Simpson. I was looking at the the, the one in 100 chance of a surge, which was, you know, on three meters, becoming the one in the three in 100 chance, a 3% probability of, of a three meter surge. So you can get um, the surge of a storm. Yes, it depends on the intensity, but it depends on many other factors as well. The, the geographic size of the storm, um, the uh, the orientation of the storm, its heading, its translation speed. So many factors go into the surge. And I think it was specifically about the surge. Uh, maybe he has a follow-up question. If, um, but, um, but for sure, um, a strong, strong, everything else held constant, a stronger storm will drive more surge. Great. Um, I don't know if, Bruce, if you had um, any follow-up to that. Um, you've sent me your question via email, of course, so I'm not sure if you're unmuted or... Uh, Kyle, can you unmute Bruce Ritchie just to make sure he's got what he needs? Can you hear me okay? There, we can hear you now, Bruce. Thank you. Okay, I can hear you, yeah. So the second part of that question was, is there a corresponding increase for other parts of the state or the state as a whole? Um, yes. Yes, there is. Um, I mean, I, I, I focused in on Tampa because it's particularly surge vulnerable, but 
there, there are many other parts of Florida that are surge vulnerable for sure. And, and, and they would see, um, you know, increases as well. I mean, I haven't done the exact amount, whether it's one to 3% or two to 5%. I mean, each one will vary a little bit, but for, but for, for sure there will be increases. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, do we have any other questions? Um, we've had a uh, very, uh, want to appreciate everyone for spending time with us today. We had really good participation and this uh, webinar will be, uh, is being recorded and it will be housed at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy webinar archive at cleanenergy.org. So um, there was obviously a lot of very uh, good information and people may want to uh, refer back. Um, one more last question that someone's uh, asking for some clarity, just to be clear. Is 2018 going to be an active season compared to 2017? No, the, the, our low skill forecasts um, are for a season that's about equal to the historical average. So that would be lower than 2017 because 2017 was well above the historical average. Okay. But I always have to add the proviso there that um, these are, you know, slight shifts in probability. So, um, it's still possible, even when we forecast an average season or even a below average season, that you could get a very devastating landfall. And, and Dr. Hall, does, is that just your opinion or is that Goddard's opinion or NASA's opinion? What, that you can get an intense storm in a low activity season? No, your, your projection to 2018. Well, it's not really an opinion. It's just the results of um, the forecast model I built. Yeah, but it, but you understand that it's sort of making news in the sense that it's actually a lower projection than what the National Hurricane Center has forecast. No, it's not. Actually, the National Hurricane Center um, and other five or six other forecasting agencies forecasting about an average. Well, they said slightly above average. Well, that was maybe um, they they do this in different phases. So if you looked earlier in the forecast cycle, it may have been slightly above average, but I think the current one is just kind of spot on average. Okay, I'll check that, thanks. Great. Um, last thing I will mention is Dr. Hall will be uh, coming in person to uh, Florida. He'll be presenting at the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council on Monday, uh, June 11th, and um, we'll also have a public event in Miami uh, the evening of June 12th at the new uh, CIC um, uh, startup lab, and we'll send that around so people are aware of that. And I'm easily available at susan at cleanenergy.org if you ended up with some specific questions and wanted to get in touch with Dr. Hall later, we'd be um, happy to facilitate all that. So, uh, so with that, I don't see any more uh, ch chats or hands up. Um, and uh, Dr. Hall, I really appreciate your time and your insight and your ability to explain a very complex topic um, in, in fairly understandable terms. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Okay, bye, everyone. <laughs>